Okay, so I would like to start off by thanking um, Heidi and also the network for New Media, Religion, and Digital Cultures for this award. Um, it's a great honor to be awarded this, and it really gives me the validation that the work that I do is important and it's actually valued. So thank you for that. Um, and just to let you know, I'm a little nervous. So if I'm unclear about something, please don't hesitate to uh, get me to clarify in the chat or, or any other means. I'm happy to do so. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by introducing myself and my research. I'll then move on to talking about what is digital religion, although I'm sure many of us already know what this concept consists of. But I need to explain it in order to show why I care about it and why we should all care about it and realize its importance and insignificance in all of our everyday lives. So digital religion is as common as watching TV for many of us or Netflix or Disney Plus if some of us don't have cable or watch TV anymore. So once we know what digital religion is, we can take a look at what kinds of work and research has been done already in, in this field and what the current state of the field is. I'll then situate my research findings in this field and show the significance of it. Um, through this, I'll be able to also show the contribution that I'm making that my research has been making, has made in the field of digital religion and what my future plans are, are for contributing um, for, to continue contributing to this field. So there's so much to be explored. It is always evolving, being in this limitless space of cyberspace. You know, it, it just offers us to continue evolving and changing religious and non-religious needs and wants and desires. So there's always something new to explore and study in this field. Um, so yeah, my name is Sana Patel. Um, I actually grew up in Saudi Arabia and I migrated to Canada at a very young age. And when I came to Canada, I saw a lot of people from different religions and different types of Muslims as well. So to me, this was very fascinating because before this in Saudi Arabia, I, I only saw how Islam looked in that country. It was only one type of Islam, one type of religion. Of course, I knew other religions existed, but as a kid, I didn't really get to see it. So in Canada, when I saw a Muslim woman who would wear non-traditional uh, hijabs like I do now, and meeting different types of Muslims who didn't practice Islam the way I did, I was always interested in this. I wanted to know, you know, what are the differences? Why are there so many differences? Um, with different religions, what do people do? It's not as black and white as, as I was taught religion is or how Islam is when I was younger. So I decided to do my master's in religion. I wanted to know more about religions. Uh, how many religions are there? What kind of different religious practices are there? Um, how come there are so many different types of Muslims and is that really okay? So while I was researching Muslim identity for young South Asians in Toronto, something that came up in all of the interviews that I did for my thesis was the internet. Every person that I spoke to would mention that, oh, they would go online to look up something about Islam. If they didn't know what Muslims were supposed to do in a situation, they would just go online. So this was around 2014, 2015, when I did my master's field work. And this was right before the popularity for Twitter or X now. And this was way before Snapchat and TikTok, I believe. So <clears throat> at that time, these young Muslims that I spoke to, they would go on to YouTube to watch a lecture by an imam, or they would go on to like a message board to ask a question, to kind of read the questions and answers that people were discussing on these online forums. And from this, I really wanted to explore, well, what else is happening in, in the online world <clears throat> when it came to religion and especially Islam. So I decided to dig into this further um, for my PhD project. So the past six, seven years, I, I just spent talking to Muslims about what religion actually meant to them. How did they conduct their religious research online? What does the internet offer them that offline spaces doesn't or these offline spaces don't offer them and um what is so different about the internet and how do they differentiate between authentic real religious information versus information that anyone can just make up how do they make sense of all of this and 
while I was doing these interviews, the ideas of lived religion or lived Islam kept coming up. And it really came down to what they thought was right, what they thought was authentic. It was about their relationship with God. And the internet actually just made it so easy for them to access this Islamic information that they weren't able to access before. Um, they could just go online and look for actual primary Islamic sources if they wanted to know, well, can I do this as a Muslim? Um, well, well, there's the internet. So they're just going to go look up a translation of the Quran, go look up some hadith translations of the hadith and kind of make their own decisions from from that so um putting my muslim identity aside i just dove into the world of muslims online and studied what muslims did online why how how many followers did these famous imams have on their social media platforms on twitter facebook instagram why were they the ones who had millions of followers and how are they different from these other Muslim influencers or vloggers who made YouTube videos and channels about, hey, I'm a Muslim, come pray with me or let's go fast. It's Ramadan. This is how we spend Eid. Like what was authentic, what was not, what was being influenced and what was not. And how did this impact the people who were watching them, who were following them, they're in real life. So IRL, like how, how does that connect? I really wanted to know, did people leave the stuff that they learned online or did they bring it into their offline lives, which was away from the internet? Did this count as some sort of like hybrid thing or some type of hybrid understanding of religion that it's actually not just online and offline, but it is both? Is this what digital religion really is about? So these are some questions that I had in mind and I wanted answers to as I conducted my research for my PhD. And it was actually really hard to put it into a thesis, uh, which I just defended last year because there was just so much to talk about. But um, in this chapter that I wrote, um, Hybrid Imams, I really wanted to just focus on the religious authority aspect. So there, there is a lot of scholarly work done on Islamic religious authority. Um, and also in Islamic studies, sociology of religion on Islamic authority in general. So what is Islamic authority? Um, what are the different types of uh, schools of thought in Islam? How many Muslim denominations and sects are there? How do they each make sense of authority? Uh, what are their beliefs in authority? And what is really happening online? So yes, you know, there, there are websites that list Islamic legal rulings. Um, there are websites that have, you know, Q&A, different types of Quran recitations, these message boards and forums to discuss Islamic matters. So anyone could easily look up a hadith. A hadith is like the saying and the acts of Prophet Muhammad. So what did he do? How did he do it? But apart from that, what about Muslim communities? And what about Muslim religious identity construction? and the influence of online Islam into offline Islam. So this is what really interested me, and that's what I said to find out. And I was very intrigued by religious authority. So these imams and these religious leaders who had the power to tell people what to do and how to do it and why to do it. So thinking about religious authority, I would just think that, well, for many religious communities, uh, central religious authority is an essential part of their community, their identity, um, their religious practices. So we know for most Catholics, they look up to the Pope for guidance in their everyday lives. We know for many Tibetan Buddhist communities, they consider the Dalai Lama to be the embodiment of religious authority. Even for Muslims, there is some for some communities, there is a central religious authority, but for the Muslim community as a whole, there is debate. Should there be a central religious authority? And this has caused um, intra-religious conflict um, for some Muslims. So who really has authority? What gives them the authority? What is authentic? What is not? For Ismaili Muslims, they regard the uh, Aga Khan as the one true authority, while the Bori Muslim community, they look up to Mufaddal Safiuddin as their supreme spiritual leader. 
There's also Sufi Muslims who are members of formal institutional spiritual paths, also known as tariqas, who are led by spiritual leaders. And for the majority of Sunni Muslims, the concept of one true central authority doesn't exist. So for them, it's anyone. Anyone can have religious authority if, they, if they've got traditional religious education or it's whatever they give the authority to, which we will talk about or I will talk about later on. So all the imams, imams are Muslim clerics who lead other Muslims in prayers, um, often as head of mosque. They have traditional Islamic education. So they're recognized as authority figures that are trained in Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence. And although they do not claim any sort of divine lineage, unlike other Muslim communities like Shia Muslims, whose imams do, some of them do claim divine lineage, Sunni imams do not do that. So while the imams operate at both local and international levels, they don't link the Islamic legal rulings to a single sort of source of religious authority. You know, they'll talk about this Islamic ruling comes from this. This is how this uh, primary source was translated. Um, the consensus of scholars agreed to this. Therefore, this is the Islamic legal ruling, but it just doesn't come from one person. And then today in many Muslim communities, these imams, they operate both in their online and offline spaces. Um, they provide uh, counseling services. They give uh, public lectures, their sermons. They perform Islamic marriages, uh, among playing other roles in Muslim communities. So in doing so, they don't really claim to act as a central religious authority, but they do have some sort of religious authority. So while I was researching, I I'm thinking to myself, well, who do I believe? Uh, what do I do when I need to know something about Islam and how do I deal with it? Is it different from what my parents are going to do? What would they do if they have religious questions? What about my sister who's younger than me? My friends who are around the same age as me? You know, does it is it like a generational thing? Maybe it has to do something with the generation who grew up with computers, who grew up on the internet versus the older generations who did not. So how do they make sense of religious authority versus how do I make sense of religious authority? So this really fueled my interest in digital religion. <clears throat> so with the rise of social media in the last 20 years or so, people have been beginning to find new ways to explore their religious or non-religious identities. The internet already offered a safe space to do this, but social media really allowed people to live their lived religion and have these lived religion approaches online. And it gave people the autonomy to interpret religious texts outside of religious institutions. So they didn't need anything official. They didn't need to talk to anyone who's officially in charge, like a religious leader. They just needed the internet where they found their own sources, their own materials, and could read these materials just as they liked with their own knowledge that they learn on their own through the internet or, or whatever it is. But they didn't need validation from an official person and an official institution to look at these primary Islamic sources. So there are academic works on digital religion, like the works of Gary Bunt, we've got Heidi Campbell, of course, Lauren Dawson, Stuart Hoover, who all worked on locating religion on the internet and how to study individual individuals who are situated in online worlds with the use of religion. So with the internet and social media, new forms of religiosity have emerged that did not exist before, hence the need to study and explore them. Analyzing literature review on these topics is very important because it, it provides a context for the research topics that we do. And not only does it help with identifying gaps in the literature, but it truly justifies the relevance and importance of it. And in my view, digital religion needs to be recognized more widely. Yes, there are you know, uh, scholarly work still continuing, but I feel like it needs to be recognized on a way more wider level than it is now. Um, we've got other work on digital religion, you know, including uh, Julia Ivalvi, um, Ivanisa, we've got Robert Rosenald, they worked on, um, or they looked at uh, Muslim religious experiences on social media. 
Um, there's also work on Islamophobia because Islamophobia is so prevalent, especially in the current times in Western society. So studies like these are significant in understanding how um, minorities uh, my, or minority groups navigate their religious identities and communities in these difficult times. So this also places emphasis on the difference between online and offline worlds and what both of these really mean for people. In some cases, it's the blurred lines between these spaces that show the importance of religion and people's religiosity. But lived religion really just adds an aspect of uh, individualization of religion that is so easily found in online religion and digital religion. So I'll talk more about lived religion later, but, but just remember that it is the individualization of religion and um, yeah, we'll talk more about it later. So in addition to this, uh, religious activity online also adds to theories of mediatization of religion and society. So scholars like State Harvard and Lundby have written largely on the causes and impacts of mediatization, particularly of religion. So religious and non-religious trends online can be traced on the internet and on social media. Uh, by examining the changes in religious authority, religious or non-religious identities, and religious movements online, which is what I tried to do in my work. Research related to religion and the internet was often referred to as digital religion. So this concept including, included studying people uh, buying religious texts online, discussing religious matters on message boards, watching religious videos online, among others. Um, Campbell explained that the term digital religion does not simply refer to religion online, but also that it relates to how digital media and spaces shape religious practices and the other way around. So previously, scholars often employed this the term cyber religion to describe new activities uh, online in relation to religious communities and rituals in cyberspace. So by contrast, Campbell suggests that digital religion offers a more nuanced way to approach the technological and cultural landscapes that have made online and offline spaces integrated and blended. So as is confirmed in my research findings, that digital media, especially social media, has facilitated new pathways for new generations, for especially for young Muslims, to connect with religious authority online. Um, Campbell also developed a the theoretical framework of shaping of technology in which religious traditions are examined in how they use technology and how they shape technology. So this refers to the social shaping of technology. Uh, this theory prioritizes ways in which technology is shaped by its uh, designers and users, and it has four main perspectives of analysis. So the specific history and traditions of the of religious communities that and the scholars are studying, um, core beliefs and patterns of the religious communities, uh, the negotiation process and new media, and framing and the discourse on new media within specific religious communities. So although my research focuses on how Muslim communities navigate cyberspace, other religious traditions are also found in the study of digital religion, obviously. So Campbell also argued that the study of religion online and Jewish groups had been undermined uh, hence the significant uh, necessity to for the attention and critical examination in this area. Um, her edited collection of essays on digital Judaism explores varieties of Jewish perspectives, such as Reform, Orthodox, and heritage groups in America, Israel, and other settings. Um, uh, Campbell pointed out that there had been some studies where the Orthodox groups objected to the use of the internet. So these groups, especially rabbis, frame the internet as, I'm going to quote this, as a gateway for immoral content, a structure encouraging problematic social behaviors for members, and a sphere facilitating the secular invasion into sacred sphere of the community, end quote. So some concerns for such communities are, for example, how accessible the internet makes it to sin or to lead to sexually explicit, explicit materials and such. So in this field of digital religion and understanding how religious communities make sense of the emerging use of the internet um, for religious matters, 
uh, there there have been other studies like Campbell and Lovin asserted that this wave of researchers who are focusing on religious actors and how relationships are negotiated in online and offline spaces uh, via theoretical discussions and methodological approaches. So studying digital religion requires looking at online platforms and um, that actually offer spaces for these religion or these religious discussions and identities to exist online. Um, there have been other works on the analysis of YouTube where um, scholars have looked at the rise and significance of changing digital media environment. Um, so for YouTube, the emergence of YouTube in the mid 2000s as a dominant media platform. So um, a website or a platform like YouTube, which is which would was, or I guess still kind of is, a high volume website, a broadcast platform, a media archive, and a social network. It shows how information online is transmitted across media platforms and how people find ways to spread and look for religious information online. So I believe YouTube still plays a role in, in this and how religious information is spread, but we've got other platforms now like uh, TikTok. Uh, we've, we had Snapchat a couple of years ago and um, I will mention that later on as well because one of the imams was really well known on Snapchat, but now we've got TikTok. There's a bunch of imams on TikTok. TikTok is really quick, you know, it picks up on the algorithm. Um, so it'll keep coming back on your For You page. They're going to be short videos of imams just talking and um, uh, I guess kind of uh, connecting with the younger users of TikTok. So that's pretty interesting. And I do kind of want to look at that in the future. Um, for for other studies, uh, there was Castell who studied the emergence of a new social structure, which uh, they refer to as the new mode of development, informationalism, the capital's mode of production. He, he pointed out how online spaces depend on the diversity of cultures and institutions throughout the world. Um, he argued that societies, uh, I'm going to quote, so as societies are organized around human processes structured by historically determined relationships of production, experience, and power. So, uh, end quote, uh, so these processes and relationships that he talks about allow digital religion to take place in new forms of online religion and religious uh, media events as well. Um, for other studies, there um, have been crowds discussed the different types of media events and their influence on certain parts of society. So they looked at media events, they described that there are three scripts of media events. So there's contents, contest where events would take place under agreed rules in a place like an arena or a stadium, um, organized around legal authority. Uh, the second one is Conquest, which is usually a single day event like the televised moon landing, which falls under charismatic authority. And there's also Coronation, which is a recurrent media event that takes place on traditions and public spaces. Um, it confirms traditional authority. So the reason I talk about this study is because in, in my chapter and the data that I get for for my PhD research is at a religious media event, which I will show you later on. I do have um, a couple of short videos I want to show so you, you get the feel, the vibe of this religious media event that I'm talking about. Um, Hep and Current actually looked at the Catholic World Youth Day, which was an example of uh, individualization and the mediatization of religion. And according to, to their analysis on the Catholic World Youth Day, it showed how hybrid media events worked by bringing together media and religion. And that's what this conference does that I looked at. Um, reviving the Islamic spirit. And um, that's where I recruited the participants from. That's where I interviewed uh, half of the participants at. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later on. Um, thinking about media, um, it also has, you know, a direct impact on some religious groups. So Dawson and Henry, they looked at the Church of Movism. So this was a group um, they established in the early 1990s, and it was created by a group of students in Ottawa who gained a following from people 
with uh, so basically they created their own religious community online and their followers there were people who had uh, established careers in math and computer science and other skilled careers and they the students they had these religious documents that were fabricated taken from other religious institutions and they mixed in humor and irony into the documents and they were able to just make up this religion so it really shows that the internet offers many opportunities for religious and non-religious communities um there's also also for for new religious movements and and cults i guess as well um, if there are other religious, uh, digital religion studies as well, like Gregory Graves' research on digital Buddhism, where he used second life as an ethnographic field. Um, he found that, uh, quote, Buddhist philosophical concepts, as well as the practice of the anthropology of Buddhism, indicate a middle path, middle path between those skeptical of work, virtual worlds as valid social spaces and those who argue for their ontological distinction, end quote. So that shows that the internet can be made into spaces where religious traditions appear to create new forms of practices and beliefs where they are only virtual or, or maybe both online and offline in hybrid forms. Uh, there's also work on religious identity construction online. So Lieberman Linderman's research found that the internet allowed um, finding and spreading information on diverse religious practices and beliefs. Uh, the interactivity allowed people from different backgrounds, different religious backgrounds to kind of connect, um, that there were there was this type of interdependence on networks across time and space for information on different religious beliefs and practices. And this still continues on today, given how limitless the, the internet is. For Muslim presence on the internet, uh, there is scholarly work being done on it, um, looking at diverse Muslim communities online, Muslim minorities who create safe spaces on media platforms that they cannot create in offline spaces. Um, there are studies on issues on Islam and terrorism, such as e-jihad and much more. Uh, Gary Arbunt is one of the well-known scholars working on Islam and the internet. Um, he studied the complex issues of Islamic authority, um, showing the different um, modes of hierarchy and power in addition to personal interactions with religious authority online. Um, he's argued that the internet facilitates and re configures Muslim discourse and practices, especially on digital platforms, which results in this digitization of the sacred. So these platforms offer Quran recitations, translations, interpretations, along with ritual performances. Um, there's also Muhammad al Nawawi and Samar Hamis for, um, who wrote Islam.com. And uh, they, they looked at Islamic websites like islamonline.net, amrkhala.net, they explored the issues that arose within Muslim communities, such as Sunni versus Shia discourses about certain topics. Um, they discussed, you know, the Danish cartoons and the ideas of respect for Muslim religious figures and also gender and political issues as well. Um, I mentioned uh, Evolvi before, so she had explored how second generation uh, Italians use blogs to deal with uh, the media portrayals of Muslims and how Islam is presented as a religion that is incompatible with Italian values. Uh, she explained that through the blog Yalla, which translates to Let's Go in Arabic, serves as a third space for young Italian Muslims and as a disruptive flow of dissent. Um, the hybrid part in the identities and third spaces comes from the intersection and even clashes of their two cultures, uh, from their parents, uh, their own Italian cultures, and factors like generational gaps and perhaps even lingual and religious gaps. Um, so we've got we've got a bunch of uh, work, scholarly research done on Muslims on the internet, uh, digital Islam. Um, I won't go through other ones, but but there is work done, but there's also a gap. And in all of the, all of these research ideas that are presented, and then in the debates in relation to media and religion, they show that the internet offers um, a variety of limitless options for users and practitioners that they could they can't find in their 
offline worlds in their offline spaces. So conducting research online on digital religion, it, it's it's really complex because the information that is transmitted across social media platform, it changes rapidly as new platforms become available. Like we've got TikTok and even some other ones probably that I don't even know about yet. So religious and non-religious communities are created in these online spaces as a result of new interpretations of religious texts, whether they be primary or secondary. Uh, there is new forms of religious uh, rituals and practices. Um, there are issues on the concept of online authority. There's uh, transnational communities and the changing of meanings of sacred and evil in, in public media. So although there's been lots of research done on digital uh, or media and religion, digital religion, the study of power structures between online religious authorities on social media and their followers is lacking, which is what where I try to fill in this gap. So what direct influence is brought into their offline lives and how are Islamic authority figures validated? How are they authenticated in online spaces? <clears throat> So in my chapter, the results from, from this research and analysis, you know, it comes from the work that I did for my PhD. Um, in my chapter, uh, hybrid imams, young Muslims and religious authority on social media in the cyber Muslims volume, play significant emphasis on lived religion because it provides a framework to explore the ways that Islam is practiced in non-official and often unrecognized ways um, outside of established religious institutions like mosques or Islamic schools known as madrasas. So prominent scholars like um, Robert Orsi, Nancy Emmerman, Meredith McGuire and Nadia Jeltoff, they've they've looked at this approach on how to study religion that doesn't happen in religious institutions, that doesn't happen through the influence of religious leaders, of religious authority. Um, so they they looked at how uh, religious institutions influence the piety and the formal activities of practitioner, practitioners, uh, such as attending church, praying. Salah, the formal act of prayer by Muslims, um, volunteering in community. So these were like the your typical, this is what religion is, this is how people practice religion, and this is how religious institutions influence or tell people how to do religion. So so that's how how what uh scholars of religious studies, that's how they studied religion. But what about religion that's happening in other ways? So measuring relig religiosity. Um, only by the means of church or mosque attendance, therefore it's problematic because it focuses exclusively on those that are active within established institutions and it ignores the less uh, the less visible elements of religious life for many people. So uh, some people consider that some of the normal activities that they engage in in their everyday life as religious or spiritual Hence, the importance of studying these non-official and non-prescribed religious practices. So according to Orsi, lived religion is about mundane practices, vital religious narratives, and anything that falls outside of institutional religion. Emmerman also points out that the everyday of lived religion consists of religious or even non-religious practices any rituals performed by people who are non-experts and daily practices that are outside the scope of institutional religious events in both public and private spheres. Um, for McGuire, she emphasized that some of the participants in her research consider just regular ordinary things like uh, gardening or healing as a vital religious or spiritual activities. Uh, Jeldov used the term reconfigured religious practices to describe how Muslims in her research customize their own individual routines of daily religious life. Um, ritual activities that were not necessarily connected with an institutional form of Islam, so that were not influenced or prescribed by a mosque or someone at the mosque. So a focus on lived religion allows us to look at how some Muslims, especially in my research, how young Muslims engage with religious authority and how they consider the non-normative ways that Islam is lived and understood. 
So are young Muslims in North America practicing Islam exclusively through religious institutions, or do they experience and express their own particular ways of being Muslim, which includes distinct understandings of authority and what is authentic and what is not? So in my research, the lived religion approach brought to the surface a diversity of thinking about Muslims and Muslim religious authority, especially for the participants in my interviews. So their presence on social media, especially on websites and apps that they identified like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, it showed their how they were connecting with religious authority figures, um, how they followed them, how they liked them, what they retweeted, what they requoted. And some of the participants also uh, use social media and the internet to conduct their own independent search searches on religious matters. It just shows how they approach religious, religious institutions and authority online. <clears throat> so for, for my research, I went to Reviving the Islamic Spirit Conference. This is an annual gathering of Muslims in Toronto. It happens every year. It's been happening for over 20 years. I believe it happened. The first one was right after 9-11 to show that Muslims are peaceful and Muslims aren't how they're showed in the media. It was actually started by a group of students. So it's it's a conference, happens around Christmas time. And uh, I believe the numbers, there's no official report on the numbers, but from my research, from speaking to the organizers, it's over 20,000 people from around the world attend this event. And you really need to see some of these videos to kind of get the vibe of what I'm talking about. So while you're watching this, I'm just gonna show a minute or two of of these two videos and just while you're watching you just think about like this is where I was this is where these young Muslims go to look at these religious leaders that they see online there are candles that have been lit from the light of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam take that light into the darkness descending upon this world and let's light up this world he didn't become a hater against the very people who hated him he didn't scowl in the face of the people of Mecca and say, oh, you all are Jahannamiyun going to hell. No. When Mecca became dark, he became the light of Mecca. He's the most documented figure in history. His walk, his talk, his statements, his thoughts, how he loved and fought, what he was and was not, everything that he taught was there for you to read. He's the man who had the world at his feet and will go days without food to eat. He loved the poor and the meek. God was all that he would seek. Of the completeness of Allah's favor upon you is when he provides for you what is enough for you and keeps away from you what may lead you to rebelliousness. That arrogance is corrupting your character and it's changing your condition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Check your ego at the door. Put your nafs aside and approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When did Allah close the door on you? When did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell you you can't approach? The wealthy is not the one who has the most, but the one who needs the least. So that's just um, a little bit of their <clears throat> promotion video they, that they put out for last year, for last December. And every year they make a promotional video well, promoting RIS, come to RIS, look at all these motivational speakers, these religious leaders that are talking about forgiveness, um, uh, submitting to God, the love that God has. And you can see how they've made it pretty fascinating and pretty like, I mean, just look at the space, space uh, stage, how glamorous it is with, with the background, the waterfalls, the music, and that big stage, and people just get to, you know, sit and watch them. So that that's one. And I 
do want you to see uh, this one as well. Powerful. Islam in crisis. Really? Really? We need a reform, something that's going to make it something like what some Western elites think a religion should be, so it's privatized and turned into another variation of modernity. So everybody on earth, God forbid, can be the same. Really? What really counts is those four heads. Okay, so so you, again, you know, you see all the music, you see the people watching them, enjo enjoying themselves with the the Muslim concerts that are put on, and it, it really is a fascinating place. Like, like you really need to be there. So what I did was I conducted a total of fifty interviews with participants that I got at this conference, um, and I recruited them in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen. It took a few few years to complete all my interviews because of COVID. Um, so again, you know, RIS it attracts over twenty thousand Muslims and non Muslims from around the world. Um, during COVID times, some of the conference or I guess like for a year or two the conference took place on online it was all virtual but other than that it takes place at the Toronto Metro Convention Center um many speakers at these events that you saw um I uh, saw were, were identified in in the research as people that they followed online and we saw um Yasser Qadi earlier there was Omar Suleiman in in one of the videos and they, they're known as prominent religious authority figures, especially for some young Muslims in the Sunni community. Um, what else? So I informally recruited participants in 2018. I just went around uh, this uh, bazaar uh, or the, the marketplace that they had in, in this space. So what we saw, the videos that we saw right now. Um, On the carpets. Sorry. I'm and those carts uh, submitting to the law. I don't know if I can do it, but yeah, so th this is what you see. This is the stage um, where they would give lectures and uh, they would have their concerts and you see like this kind of fandom. And then apart from that, you would kind of walk out of the hall and then there's like like um, a marketplace where people are selling clothes. Uh, there's NGOs, NPOs uh, who are there for like petitions, uh, donations. And so this this marketplace was very informal uh, in comparison to the lecture hall that they had. So I informally, you know, spoke to people. I went around recruiting them, getting their information. And uh, the next year, they actually gave me a booth. So I was like one of the people who who had a whole stall. I had my recruitment materials and I would talk to people about my research. This is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to talk to you about. And then in total, I got 50 people who actually contacted me or I was able to set up interviews with them. Um, so in order to participate in my study, I couldn't just pick anyone. I had to have a criteria and I had to make it as narrow as possible for my research and ethics board. So what I decided on was, OK, I want to talk to Canadians and Americans. There are a lot of Americans who come to this event. So if you're a citizen or if you're a PR or if you have a green card of, uh, you know, from the U.S. or Canada, then, you know, that that's one thing you have to check off. Um, You have to be between the ages of 18 to 40. I really want to know what the millennial generation of Muslims are doing online. You have to self-identify as Muslims. You have to have an, uh, a presence on social media. And of course, you have to have attended RIS because I didn't want to just recruit from all different places. So I had to make them RIS conference attendees. So this criteria allowed me to focus on participants who identified as Muslim millennials. Um, most of them actually identified as Sunni with only a small number of them identifying as Shia or other Muslim minority communities. So over the course of the two, two, three years that I interviewed people, 
Um, I talk to them in person and also online because of uh, COVID. So online, I did the interviews on Skype, FaceTime, and WhatsApp videos. Uh, the interviews were like an hour long. And in addition to these interviews, I also included participant observation as a methodology. So RIS takes place, RIS Re Reviving the Islamic Spirit. This conference takes place over three days during the Christmas holidays. Uh, people from all around the world come. They take part in, you know, conference activities. So I observe things like, well, some of these celebrity imams, these hybrid imams that I talk about, when they would come out of the, the speaker hall, um, there'd be groups of people just following them around into the marketplace, into the bazaar, and uh, it would you could really see like a celebrity and a fan um thing going on there so that was that was really fascinating for me to see um there was also an instance in 2019 where when Tariq Jamil uh, who is an imam from Pakistan when he was on the stage giving his lecture his uh, uh speech a fan jumped onto the stage to to hug him the security escorted him out so that was something to see so this style of like communication and interaction, it really shows the dynamics of hierarchy that's created in a space like reviving the Islamic spirit. And it also shows how authority is given to these popular imams. So it, in my in my understanding, in my view of what I saw, the hybridity that I talk about in, you know, it's not just online, offline, it's actually both. It actually emerges in a space like RIS. Um, it shows both the online and the offline worlds where people get to see their celebrity imams from their social media following, from their social media experiences into their offline world. <clears throat> So the chapter, it spotlights issues relating to religious authority and social media with a particular emphasis on lived religion, as I mentioned earlier. So the findings really show how young Muslims uh, perceive religious authority and authenticity in both online and offline spaces by showing their interactions with uh, prominent religious figures. Like the ones identified in the interviews were Yasser Qadi, uh, Soheb Webb, Mufti Menk, and Omar Suleiman. There were a few more, but I really just kind of focused on these four. So the pictures that you see up here, uh, the first picture on, on your left is Mufti Menk with Yasser Qadi. So Mufti Menk uh, posted this on his Facebook with the caption, did you know Dr. Yasser Qadi is my age and I met him briefly for the first time today? in South Africa. So Yasser Qadi is the one with the glasses. And they were like, yeah, almost over 900 comments. And everyone was just like, oh, you know, this is, these are my two favorite imams. Oh, you know, like, mashallah, you're together. You took a picture together. That's amazing. And then the other picture you see there is Omar Suleiman, who we saw in the RIS video as well. And uh, he's getting arrested here. This this is pretty recent for one of the protests that he did. So he's very active, um, which I will talk about later. Um, so while I was discussing these uh, celebrity imams with the people that I interviewed, um, I wanted to know how do they practice their religion in their everyday lives? Like, what does this have to do with the religious authority figures that they follow or that they like on social media? What specific roles do these authority figures play in their identity formation, in their in their worldviews, in their understanding of Muslim practices? And um, yeah, so those are some of the questions that I had while I was doing the interviews. So even though the idea of central religious authority is contested within the Muslim community, RIS, it effectively acts as a space where multiple religious authorities are brought together from both online and offline worlds. At each annual conference, many of the featured speakers are recognized as prominent religious authority figures for the North American Sunni Muslim community. So in 2018 and 2019, Yasser Qadi was one of the featured speakers at RIS, I believe last year as well. Uh, he's an Islamic scholar based in Houston, Texas, and he's one of the founders of Al Maghrib Institute, which is an online Islamic institution where users can take virtual classes with various Islamic uh, teachers on a range of Islamic uh, topics. He also has a PhD from Yale University. Uh, he teaches at Rhodes College in Memphis. Um, 
In the interviews that I did, uh, participants confirmed that they were motivated to attend this conference to learn from key religious authority figures like Hadi himself. So he does have a prominent online presence. He regularly posts on Facebook and Twitter um, on both of the websites. I believe he has, or at least on Facebook, he has over a million followers. And uh, on Twitter, I think he has almost a million followers. So these social media platforms, they allow people to have some type of interaction with people like him. Uh, these uh, impersonal interactions don't really compare to meeting them at an event or seeing them in in live, like, like at RIS though. Um, <clears throat> so young Muslims that, that I spoke to, they describe a fascination with seeing people like Hadi face to face and they equate it with meeting uh, like a popular celebrity. So they talk to them in, you know, um, about talk to them with glowing, uh, glowing terms, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, it was so great to see him or it was like a dream come true seeing him. And there were also other people that they would kind of talk about like that, like performers, like there was Khalid Sadiq who's a British uh, rapper and there and a YouTuber. There was Brother Ali who's an American rapper and activist. So in that fandom and the celebrity hierarchy, you see these religious leaders, but also these musicians and rappers. So that was pretty interesting. Um, also in the interviews, in addition to looking forward to and interacting with some of these popular religious leaders, um, the participants said that they followed them on social media. Um, one of the participants actually talked about Soheb Webb and he, Soheb Webb, I'm going to show you uh, a video later later on, just in the next slide. But Soheb Webb is uh, one of the prophetic uh, online celebrity imams. Um, he was previously the imam at the Islamic Society of Boston in 2016. He was especially popular among North American Muslim youth, uh, famous for delivering eight second Islamic legal rulings on Snapchat and his virtual sermons on Snapchat, where he uh, tried to, well, I guess he did mix uh, popular media with Islamic matters. So he would have well, today's Friday sermon, Friday khutbah is going to be on The Walking Dead and we'll talk about death in Islam or, you know, something like that. Um, I I mentioned Mufti Menk earlier, um, who took the picture with Yasser Qadi. So he's another religious authority figure with the uh, popular online presence as well uh, among the participants. He's based in Zimbabwe and he has over 7 million global followers. He's known for his motivational tweets and khutbahs that incorporate comedy to attract attention from young Muslims. Um, all right, so this is Suhaib Webb. Hey, this is Suhaib. I'm here in the studios of AJ+. Plus. This is the language of today. You know, the Prophet Muhammad was given the Quran because poetry was kind of what was popping in the Arabian hood. So, this is the way that we communicate. Everyone from girls with like body shaming issues, should I vote for Bernie or not, abortion, teenage pregnancy, it's opened up a way for people to ask. And that's really why I got into social media. <laughs> I and others who were mentioned pose a threat because we undermine the very pathos that Islam and the West are incompatible. Who concerns you more right now, ISIS or Donald Trump? I get death threats from the far right much more frequently than I do from ISIS. One of our major legal axioms is al-urfu'l-mahkam, which means culture is a decider. And that really gave a lot of license for interpretation in the sense of how culture flows through the religion. Religion doesn't necessarily try to close a culture down. How you package it, I mean, if you want to if you want to spit bars like Jericho, do it. If you want to spit bars like K dot, do it. If you want to be like Nas, you do it. It doesn't care about that. Right? It cares about the message, not necessarily the packaging. Okay, I, I have a feeling I'm running out of time, <laughs> but you see at the beginning of the video, he, he talks about how it's so important to reach a younger audience and you do this through social media. Well, I'm not sure how many people use Snapchat anymore, but you know, we've got apps like TikTok now, but you also see how he talks about connecting with uh, 
younger audience through talking about rappers like uh, K Dot and J Cole and and Nas. I'm pretty sure he said it here or there. So that's the type hey, of Iman cool. he is. Um. Okay. So, what what about my work? Like, how is it contributing to digital religion? Well, the work that I'm doing it illustrates and it highlights the changes and evolution of religious authority from offline to online spaces, while showing a hybrid in between that exists as well. It also shows how young Muslims make sense of what is religious authority, how is it authentic, and how is it not. So the massive volume of religious information. Um, online, it informs their religious identities and understandings of Islam in, in these different ways. So having websites like Islam Q&A, um, having social media interactions with celebrity imams and the constant stream of materials found on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and these other social media platforms, it really shows how young Muslims seek to create their own ways of practicing Islam and formulating their own religious identities. So while it is true that having unlimited access to religious resources on the internet is beneficial for many young Muslims, um, it can also present doubts and tensions. And some of the participants in, in my interviews did as well. They showed how they were hesitant when it came to some resources that they found online in relation to Islamic questions. They questioned the how legitimate these sources were what, that they found online. So although they did go on certain websites like Islam Q&A, they had to still filter through these websites and the information that they found on there. They had to look for specific references to the Quran, to the ayah, and or the Quran and ayahs and hadith, and that's how they would know this is authentic or or it's not authentic or where where are they getting this Islamic information from? Some of them also questioned. Uh, the authenticity of these celebrity imams that they followed and liked. Yes, they followed and they liked them, but, you know, are, are they really referencing the Quran and the Hadith like they should? So this kind of shows a key point that within North America, within the young Sunni Muslim community, again, like there is no central religious authority. We mentioned this earlier, but even after having done this research, there is no central religious authority. It's a reality for, for the Muslim community. And this is what has encouraged young Muslims in North America to practice taking primary Islamic sources and interpreting it on their own. That's how they navigate the online world of, of all the Islamic information that they found. Um, I'm going to just kind of uh, skip over and uh, just kind of conclude that the people that I interviewed, they really struggled to get new answers to the same old questions. You know, what does religious authority really look like? How How is it authentic? How is it not? What about these celebrity imams? And well, what about the future, right? So for, for me, and I'm sure for all of us, we know that the internet isn't going away, right? And we know that everyone's talking about AI now. And what I want to know is that what role does AI play in religious communities now? Yeah, you know, some some Islamic communities um, have started using AI, but only for like filtering, um, finding Islamic legal rulings. But I want to know how do ordinary Muslims, how are they using AI and how is it affecting their everyday lives when it comes to religion, religious practices, lived religion? Do they take AIs as, as an authentic Islamic source? Would AI replace or maybe collaborate with celebrity imams? How will AI change the course of Islamic authority? And how will young Muslims react to that? So I'm already planning a research project around the use of AI for everyday Muslims in Canada and the U.S. Uh, lastly, I asked uh, ChatGPT about what role AI plays in religious communities. And it already gave me an answer. <laughs> so there's something that we can already work with. Um, so to work on digital religion, it's always gonna be happening. You know, it's cyberspace, it's limitless. It will always continue to evolve just like AI. Um, I recently completed my postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto, where we created an Islamophobia index to identify and ad address systemic, systematic Islamophobia in the workplace for Canadians. And I would ideally like to combine my interest on digital religion, Islamophobia, and AI to create a project around these topics. 
Um, actually, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be giving a talk on digital anti-Muslim hate uh, for the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. And I hope to continue my work on digital religion that way as well. I'm currently getting trained um, to turn my academic work into public scholarship. So I really hope this brings awareness to the field of digital religion for the general public. Um, I, I'd, I'd also like to mention that this is my first year on the job market as a recent graduate, and I find that the field of digital religion is not recognized as much as it should be. So research on digital religion can be situated in many departments like sociology, digital humanities, religious studies, communications, media studies, but I haven't seen many searches for experts in digital religion, although it is imperative that we do so because of its importance and interdisciplinary nature. So I'm talking about the North American job market because this is where I have been looking. So this is why the efforts, the support and actions of this network for new media, religion, and digital cultures is really crucial, and I really appreciate them. So thank you again for this great honor. Thank you so much, Santa, for your lecture. It's great to kind of hear kind of how your thinking has evolved over time, as well as how this kind of research project has developed. So I'd like to kind of um, open it up for questions um, for people who have any questions about um, either things that uh, Santa has researched in this particular project related to her thesis or things she's looking into in the future. So if you have a question, please just um, raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. Um, Rebecca. Hi, thank you so much, Sana. That was wonderful. And it is, um, and, and I've been to uh, RIS uh, a number of times, and it is a great venue for doing research, especially for young people. Um, one of the questions I had uh, in terms of your research is, are you looking at all at gender, at uh, how these young people are viewing issues of gender? I know when I first started going to RIS, um, there weren't as many women <laughs> uh, speakers. Um, now they tend to have at least 40 to 50% of the speakers are, are, are women. And also the whole issue of race has has been uh, a concern and I and I'm particularly have voiced that concern but risk has been pretty good about having uh, a, a diverse uh, racial uh, composition to their uh, presenters but are, were those issues that you looked at at all in your research yeah so I'll I'll start, what I'll do is like, I'll, I'll try to answer your questions and then we can move on to the next person. I think that wish I can at least remember what I'm talking about. Um, so gender and race were not topics that I plan to ask about. And actually in my interviews, I did not. However, uh, gender just came about, especially when I was talking to women and their, their concerns were, yes, there are women speakers, but there's not there are not enough of them or there there'll be women speakers and they won't really talk about gender issues though they'll be there to talk about yes you know let's be let's all be forgiving you know we have to be good muslims be kind to each other but what about the gender issues the gender role issues that we have in our in our community for some of us right so the part some of the participants especially women did raise those concerns and what i noticed in my participant observation was you know, we have these women speakers and they don't have this fandom that the male speakers and the main e male imams did, you know, getting followed around the bazaar, having uh, multiple pictures taken, the, this entire fandom thing. I did not see that for the women speakers. And also the male speakers, so many of them were actually religious leaders. So many of them were imams or sheikhs. And then you see like two sheikhs and all the other ones are sisters, sister this, sister that, but they don't have like the religious leader titles, although they may have the training, but they're not regarded as religious leaders. So that's something that I observed. I did actually write a little bit about it in my thesis as well. Um, and then for race, I, I know recently there has been comments by some of the speakers like Hamza Yusuf, which have been controversial and that he said about BLM and- uh, Yeah, I was Black. there. I was okay. There. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I wasn't there. I, I think I was like in the bazaar while that was happening. But uh, I remember when I was doing the interview, some some people did bring it up. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what did he say? And they were like, I can't believe, you know, he was not in support of BLM or he had this negative view. And guess what? He still invited the year after, even <laughs> though he said something problematic. So yeah. um, uh, some people mentioned it, but it wasn't something that I could actually explore. Although that is an interesting um, aspect of it. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Um, Julia. Hi. So first of all, congratulations. And that was a very interesting lecture. Actually, um, the previous question sort of like um stole what I wanted to ask because my question was also about gender. Since in the videos I almost only saw men, maybe two women. So I was wondering, but you already answered that. But I do have a backup question. I really appreciated you mentioning artificial intelligence at the end. And I think that as a direction in digital religion, we really need to explore different technologies. So now I know you work with interviews, but you also mentioned different platforms such as TikTok that are, let's say, platforms for young people. Um, so I would say that we really need to find methods, but also theories um, to explore let's say TikTok, but also the new platforms and, um, you know, also the use of Instagram, let's say, um, things that can be more creative and maybe more visual, but also more immediate than, let's say, YouTube. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if you have any idea here of maybe in your current projects, you are exploring different platforms um, a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um... Th those are really good questions because I have been thinking about them as well. I I really want to do like a dive on celebrity imams on TikTok, but when I think about doing it, when I sit down, I think about how how am I going to, what is the methodology that I'm going to use for examining these imams on a social media platform like TikTok? If I'm studying someone on Facebook or Instagram, I, I can do digital archives right I, I can take screenshots and I can go back to it I can look at the comments but for something like TikTok it's where it's even hard to go back to the video if you don't really take take a note of where it's from and it, it's just so fast and I, I honestly don't know but you're right we do need new methods perhaps to kind of think about how we can observe and analyze these really new emerging uh, platforms like TikTok. And and for AI, what I, I've been trying to look for how AI is used in the Muslim world. So the past couple of weeks, I've just been Googling, trying to look for news, you know, AI in Saudi Arabia, AI in Iran. So one of the pictures on the slideshow was uh, from, uh, from Iran, like you get a fatwa, you get a fatwa, like sure, you know, we know AI can be used to uh, filter fatwas and um, filter through these Islamic legal rulings. But what really, what more than that? If Chad GPT is used to, you know, hey, write my cover letter for me, or, you know, what about when it comes to religion? Hey, can Muslims do this? You know, are people actually listening to AI when it comes to that? So these are some ideas that I have, but I haven't got a, I guess I don't have like a clear, clear pathway as to how I'm going to do this research, but I know I want to do it. I'm really dedicated and I'm really, um, I really have the motivation to do it, but I just have to kind of find methods to do it, which I believe we don't really have for using like AI and, and TikTok. And I don't know, we'll see, but thank you. I, it really gets me thinking. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, we have a question in the chat, so give me a second to read this. It says, um, this is from uh, Humza. She uh, says that as a society is increasingly becoming more non-traditional, what can we forecast for Islam to evolve into as Islam itself is a traditional religion? As when, I, as when I prayer, as when I go to prayer on Fridays, there's usually only mentions announcements for males and mainly yet the world moves to become more equal. Yeah, I mean, it, is Islam really a traditional religion when you think about how young Muslims, especially the ones that I researched, are um, 
are accessing religious information and how they're making means of religious authority, how they're giving authority to religious speakers. So I'm not really sure if I would actually call Islamic traditional religion anymore. I mean, sure, there is like um, the five pillar pillars of Islam that almost every Muslim will say that they believe in. But because of the internet now, uh, people have this easy access to, to the internet where they can individualize their religious beliefs and practices and it's going to continue evolving because of things like AI and just because the internet is not regulated so it's going to be interesting to see what shifts and changes there are going to be in, in Islamic religious beliefs and practices. We have time for one more question and if anyone has a question. Well, I'll take the uh, uh, moderator's right to ask the last question then. You know, um, thank you, uh, um, Sana, for giving us a great overview of kind of how your works is contextualized in relation to other research about, you know, not just digital religion, but especially authority online. Um, and so I would like to hear from you based on, you know, your findings. To what extent do you see that the questions and issues uh, that are being asked within, you know, uh, Islam and especially among the young people that you were studying, um, in what ways are they kind of very similar or echo what we have heard before from other religious traditions, concerns about religious authority? And is there any one thing that's maybe unique or new um, in the kind of directions or questions that are being asked within um, not just your research of Dix, but kind of Islam um, broadly? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'm thinking about COVID because of the changes that COVID inspired almost all religious traditions and communities had to shift online. And although they were some were already present on the internet before, COVID really made sure everyone was online. And for some communities, you know, they, they've stuck online. They've made a hybrid ways of practicing online and offline. So it's not exclusive to the Muslim communities, although that is what, what I studied. But even now, like we there are still local imams at the mosque who maybe the older generation will go to. But maybe if it's a question where the person wants to stay anonymous, they're going to go on to the Internet. So I guess this can be uh, this can be the same for other religious traditions as well. And um, I didn't, I did a, a little more of a literature review than I wanted to, but I just wanted to show, like, look at all the important work that is happening in digital religion. Look, look at all these different types of research projects. There's just so much to look at, so much to analyze in digital religion. And it's never going to stop because every it's going to continue evolving. Everyone has this access to the online world and, and it keeps changing and there'll never be enough. There'll never be like, okay, enough people have looked at Muslims online. We need to do something else now. It, I don't think it'll ever be like that. So I'm actually kind of excited to be in this field. And yeah, I just want to keep continuing researching. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Well, Santa, I just want to say thank you for your presentation and um, thank you for uh, 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 submitting. And it's an honor to um, you know to see you as the um, 2023 Digital Religion Research Award winner. Um, uh, in, in, um, in the mail is coming to Santa soon. The uh, a plaque that says you know to 2023 Digital Religion Research Award is presented to Santa Patel by the Network for New Media Religion and Digital Culture Studies in recognition of outstanding scholarship in digital religion studies. So I'm happy that you are our fifth. It's nice to see a young scholar with a lot of potential ahead, a lot of energy, and I'm gl glad that what you bring to the field and what you will bring to field in the days and the years to come. And um, and lastly, I just want to just remind um, our participants that we have a call out for the 2024 Digital Religion Research Award. It'll be circulated soon online and to the network's um, email list. Um, but I encourage you, if either you or one of your students or a colleague of yours you know that has published something in the last two years that you think is kind of um, uh, um, adds a unique angle or contribution to the field, please ask them to consider submitting um, the uh, for the award. We just need a copy of their, any copy of their publication, and then just a one or two page letter describing what their work contributes to the field. And um, uh, it's been great to kind of spot, uh, spotlight a lot of the international and interesting work that's happening. 
Um, so for, um, again, I just want to say thank you to, to Santa. I want to give you a chance to say any last words you have. Um, and then thank you for everyone for attending. So Santa. Yeah. I'd just like to also say thank you to everyone for attending and thank you Heidi and the network for giving me this great honor to be awarded this award. Um, actually, I remember the first time the call came out, I was like, one day I will get it. One day, you know, <laughs> I'll be able to contribute to digital religion. And I'm so happy that I'm here. And I'm really thankful for all the support from all the mentors. I've got everyone here in, in the audience. You know, thank you. I see that Gary's here and Ruby was here as well. And I wouldn't be here without you all. And Julia and Heidi, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for attending. We will um, have uh, be putting this lecture up online and again, that will be posted in social media to let you know. So anyone you know who wasn't able to make this, you know, because I know with international kind of time schedules, it's hard to kind of find time for everybody in all parts of the world. But thank you everyone and um, have a, a good rest of your day. And again, keep uh, doing good digital religion research, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>